evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson. And if you're Joe Biden, if you think about it, it takes a lot of brass to brag about Afghanistan or even mention the word. You'll notice Bill Clinton doesn't casually drop the term Monica Lewinsky in conversation. He tries to forget it ever happened. And you'd think Biden would feel the same way about Afghanistan. His withdrawal from that country almost a year ago was the single most humiliating moment in American foreign policy since the fall of Saigon in April of 1975. There are a lot of ways to pull out of Afghanistan. Biden chose a path that seemed designed to inflict maximum damage to the interests of the United States. He did that. Kind of no debating it. But Biden is not ashamed of it. He wasn't ashamed of it then. He's not ashamed of it now. Tonight, Biden gave a speech boasting that he's killed an al-Qaeda figure in Afghanistan. Great. Feel safer? Of course you don't. Nobody does. And the reason nobody feels safer is Biden's response to the disaster in Afghanistan. Rather than pause and learn from it, maybe fire the people responsible for it, not simply the self-destructive withdrawal from Afghanistan, but also the pointless 20-year war there, rather than do any of that like a normal person would do, Biden immediately set off in another direction, provoking yet another conflict, this one in Eastern Europe. And he provoked it. They lie about it, but it's true. The facts are out there, and it's very obvious. So just days after the Russian government announced yet again that if Ukraine joined NATO, NATO didn't even want Ukraine to join, but if Ukraine were to join NATO, then the Russian army would invade Ukraine. So days after they said this for like the 50th time in a row, Kamala Harris arrived at the Munich Security Conference and publicly, reading from a script, called for Ukraine to join NATO. She read the words. They were written by someone at the State Department, so they knew exactly what they were doing when they did it. They wanted a war with Russia, and now we have one. We're not winning that war, by the way. The main American casualty so far has been our economy, which is dying. So what was the point of this exercise? Maybe someday they will tell us. But we don't have time to think about it because now we have yet another potential war to contend with. And it comes in Asia, just what we need. This week, with the blessing of the Biden administration, Nancy Pelosi decided to head to Taiwan. That's all but confirmed at this point. Government officials in Taipei have just been notified that Pelosi's arrival is imminent. She may be in the air right now. She's definitely coming, one source told the Wall Street Journal. The only variable is whether she spends the night. So Nancy Pelosi goes to Taipei. What's the effect of that? Well, we don't need to guess. The Chinese government has said repeatedly and clearly that if Nancy Pelosi lands in Taiwan, it could trigger a global war. Watch. A Chinese spokesperson said there would be serious consequences for the visit over the weekend conducting military drills at sea. If House Speaker Pelosi insists on visiting Taiwan, China will take resolute and strong measures to defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity. Are they bluffing? It doesn't sound like it, actually. A representative of Chinese state media said this, quote, if U.S. fighter jets escort Pelosi's plane into Taiwan, it is an invasion. The Chinese army has the right to forcibly dispel Pelosi's plane and the U.S. fighter jets, including firing warning shots and making tactical movement of obstruction. If ineffective, then shoot them down. Oh, shoot them down. Okay. So the White House naturally was asked about this. We're suddenly on the brink of yet another global war, potentially a nuclear war, because Nancy Pelosi has been given the green light by the White House to fly to Taiwan. So what's the White House view of this? Listen. Uh, an official who is associated with Chinese state media is suggesting that if Speaker Pelosi tries to go to Taiwan, her plane could be shot down. Does the president have a response to that? You know, I've been asked about, I know you're asking specifically about uh, uh, the rhetoric that we're hearing from China, but as it relates to uh, the speaker's uh, the speaker's um, travels, uh, it's something that we're just not going to speak to right now. That's a hypothetical. It doesn't seem like a big deal to put dumb people in positions of authority. Oh, we're helping them out. She's breaking ceilings. Okay, got it. Until something terrible goes wrong, which inevitably happens when you're running the biggest country in the world. That's a hypothetical, says Karine Jean-Pierre, even though, of course, it's the opposite of a hypothetical. There's nothing hypothetical about it. China has repeatedly threatened to shoot down the plane carrying America's Speaker of the House, third in line from the presidency. And yet no one seems to think this is a big deal. 
This is one of the weirdest moments in the weirdest presidency in American history. The Biden administration is provoking a hot war with China, which by itself would seem to be headline news. But why? It might make a kind of sense if Biden had been a China hawk over the course of his career, if he wasn't taking money from the Chinese government, which he has. But of course, he's the opposite of a China hawk. He is a toady to China. Since the day Biden was elected, he has helped the Chinese government in ways that no American president has ever even contemplated. A partial list. The administration helped cover up the origins of COVID, even after it became very clear that this global pandemic, which wrecked the American economy, was created by the Chinese military. But we can't mention that because it's racist. Then the White House shut down a counter espionage program designed to stop Chinese spying, which is endemic in the United States. Then Biden dropped tariffs against Chinese goods. Then he refused to do anything to move critical manufacturing back to the United States. And at the same time, he's literally selling our strategic oil reserves to China in the middle of a domestic energy crisis. And by the way, handing our entire energy grid over to the government of China. And then to top it off today, the Pentagon spokesman, John Kirby, who acts as the White House spokesman, all of a sudden, for some reason, said this, quote, we do not support Taiwan independence. When was the last time a White House said that? No, they don't say that. Now they are saying it. We don't think Taiwan's its own country. Okay. So on every level, meaningfully on the policy levels that matter, Biden has been more pro-China than any president, and yet he seems to want a war with China now. This does not make any sense at all. In fact, it only makes sense if the Biden White House is intentionally trying to weaken and destroy the United States. There's no other logical explanation for what we're seeing now. And in fact, the template is very familiar. What's happening in China looks very much like what happened in Ukraine earlier this year. The administration sends the least capable possible emissary to a flashpoint in a faraway part of the world in order to provoke a violent response. Then it was Kamala Harris, who was an international joke, the last person you would send to negotiate any kind of peaceful settlement to the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. But they sent her anyway. She exacerbated it and they got what they wanted, which was an invasion of Ukraine and a war with Russia, which is what they wanted. Now they're sending Nancy Pelosi and not to be mean, but like Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi is senile. Don't believe it? You probably don't see her speak very often. We're gonna treat you. Here's Nancy Pelosi's explanation for why she is going to Taiwan. The um, president earlier, well, earlier in his term, talked about a strong emphasis on the Asian Pacific. Uh, he, he has visited there, the uh, vice president's visit there, the secretary of commerce and others. And uh, we want the Congress of the United States to be part of that initiative. Of course, as a West Coast person, we see the Pacific as there are, you know, that's our, their home. We're part of that as well. That is not to diminish the importance of our uh, transatlantic relationships as well. But uh, it's, it's, we're, I'm very excited, if, should we go uh, to the countries that we're, we, you'll be hearing about along the way. She's excited. She's going to assemble a slideshow. We're going to meet in the gym later and see the picture she's taking. Because it turns out as a West Coast person, and I suppose she's very much that, Taiwan has always been on her bucket list. So many nights she stared across San Francisco Bay and wondered what it's like over there in Taipei. So for Nancy Pelosi, she just told you this is a dream come true. Next year, she's going to Disney World. This year, Taipei. This is lunacy. Nancy Pelosi clearly, you just saw the tape, has no understanding of what she is doing or what might happen if she does it. No one wants to say it out loud, but the truth is she can't know. Because like Kamala Harris, she has never even been in a bar fight. She has no understanding of violence or its consequences. And there are consequences, including the potential deaths of millions of people. This is exactly the wrong time, the craziest possible time, to send an 82-year-old narcissist to Taiwan. The US has never been less ready for war, particularly for war with China. And the Biden administration has done everything it can to make certain that we are not ready for a war with China, or even with the Taliban. Biden has, since the day he took office, politicized and weakened the United States military systematically to the point we are not going to win a war against China. Sorry, that's true. 
General Mark Milley out there telling Congress that soldiers need to learn about white rage because otherwise they'll be unprepared for combat. Attacking people on the basis of their skin color? Right. Firing Navy SEALs because they won't get the vaccine? The healthiest people in the world? And they're fired because they won't get the vaccine? And then just to make totally clear what the point is, and the point, of course, is humiliation and degradation, the destruction of centuries old military traditions. Let's have drag shows on military bases. So no one, which they are now doing, no one should be surprised that people don't really want to join a military like that. A woke military, it's a joke. And the recruitment numbers show it. This is a crisis. The US military is now signing up, no exaggeration, mentally deficient troops. That's not hyperbole. The Army used to ban recruits with a history of mental health problems, including self-mutilation, because of course you would. You're not going to hand people guns if they have a history of mental instability. But now DOD is issuing waivers for those recruits because they need them, as well as for recruits with aptitude issues. In other words, with an IQ so low, it will be very difficult to navigate modern war, as well as records of drug use. But all of this lowering the standards to these points are still not enough to make recruitment goals. The Army just told Congress it has to reduce its total force strength by 10,000 next year. By 2023, we'll be 21,000 troops short. The Army has just met half of its recruiting goals so far this fiscal year with only two months left. Why? Two months left, they, they're halfway there. Well, again, because the military under Joe Biden, and no one wants to say this because it's so depressing, the last great meritocracy in the West is no longer a meritocracy. It's totally politicized. Firing soldiers who didn't take the shot. More than 60,000 National Guard and Reserve soldiers just lost pay and benefits because they wouldn't take the shot in the face of a mountain of evidence that the shot actually doesn't work and can hurt you, particularly if you're a young man who comprised the overwhelming majority of our troops. Then the military once again telling white men that they're privileged and inherently evil Major General Ed Thomas, the Air Force recruitment director, published an op-ed called, and we're not making this up, 86% of Air Force pilots are white men. Here's why this needs to change. Really? The thousands of Air Force pilots who died in the service of their country happen to be white men? Their families are now being informed, actually, they shouldn't have been flying anyway because of the race. So what does the Air Force want to become? Well, at the end of July, the Air Force hosts a diversity festival at Langley with a drag show featuring a performer called Harpy Daniels. Of course, kids are welcome. The Air Force is also paying for a bouncy house and face painting for the children to keep them occupied between all the drag shows. Meanwhile, in China, here's a video the PLA just put out this week which shows a different kind of orientation. Watch this. So what does the Air Force want to become? Well, at the end of July, the Air Force hosts a diversity festival at Langley with a drag show featuring a performer called Harpy Daniels. Of course, kids are welcome. The Air Force is also paying for a bouncy house and face painting for the children to keep them occupied between all the drag shows. Meanwhile, in China, here's a video the PLA just put out this week which shows a different kind of orientation. Watch this. Did you notice the difference? There were no trans admirals in that video. By the way, all of this is publicly available. So the next time you hear members of Congress, particularly Republican members of Congress, and we can think of quite a few of them, starting with Liz Cheney, lecturing you about our military. We support our military and we're signing off on a brand new military budget. They've done nothing about this. The degradation of the US military, politicized, woke, weak, that's happened with no oversight from the Congress. They just keep funding this stuff. They're implicated in this. There are also some pictures of China's Navy in the video you just saw. It turns out China's Navy is now larger than ours. That's a problem because once China controls the shipping lanes, China controls the economy of the world. According to the Spectator of London, this is worth thinking about, quote, if a naval blockade gave Beijing control of the export of Taiwan's semiconductor industry, which is huge, 
then Western leaders would find themselves beholden to China to keep their economies going. Russia's use of gas to dampen Western opposition to its actions in Ukraine would be dwarfed by China's ability to hold the world ransom through control of Taiwan's chips. In other words, if we went to war with China and we're moving in that direction, the Chinese could simply turn off our economy because our people in charge of our country have made no preparations for this. The Chinese government could prevent us from having, I don't know, cars that run, refrigerators, cell phones, computers. They would also be able to stop exports of antibiotics. According to the Council on Foreign Relations, Chinese pharmaceutical companies supply more than 90% of American antibiotics, as well as ibuprofen, take Advil, vitamin C, hydrocortisone, which treats asthma and arthritis. China supplies more than 70% of acetaminophen, often called Tylenol. What else does China make? Well, China makes everything, for example, that you need to transport goods across the country. China produces 96% of the world's shipping containers. They make 80% of the cranes that carry cargo from the ship to the dock. So because this has been coming at us in slow motion for a decade and a half and no one's done anything about it, we find ourselves right now, August 1st, 2022, incapable of winning a war against China. If this goes forward, we will lose. And yet for some reason, the Biden administration has allowed Nancy Pelosi to go over there to provoke a military confrontation with China. Is there any other explanation other than they are rooting for the destruction of the United States? If there is one, text us. Some Republicans, by the way, are for this. They're for all war. Mike Gallagher, who represents Wisconsin, just said, quote, I think it would be in keeping with that track record and very useful for American diplomacy and foreign policy for the Speaker of the House to go to Taiwan. Yeah, whatever. Steve Shabbat, a Republican representing Ohio, agrees with that. Quote, I think it's important that we show solidarity with our ally Taiwan, he said. Oh, okay. Are we in a position to show solidarity with our ally Taiwan? And how far are we willing to take this? China has a lot of nuclear weapons. How does that factor into the equation? They're threatening it, so you think our leaders would have a response. Kareem Jean-Pierre has no idea what's going on, which is why today the White House put the Pentagon spokesman, John Kirby, at the podium. And here's what John Kirby said. I guess I'm, I'm wondering, why did the president bother with this drama from the beginning? I mean. Why not, rather than saying the military doesn't think it's a good idea to go, why not call the Chinese bluff or, or tell them to pound sand when they started belly aching about the possibility of this trip? Given, as you pointed out, there's no change in policy and there's precedent for Pelosi to visit Taiwan. So what's the drama? What? Have you watched the Braves the last couple of weeks? I mean, there's been this question of... Yeah, I've been here the last couple of weeks. I haven't seen any drama. I think, I think you're manufacturing it with your question. So oily. I think you're manufacturing drama with your question, says the Pentagon press secretary. After China has threatened to shoot down the Speaker of the House, to kill the Speaker of the House. I think you're manufacturing drama. No, the drama's inherent. So again, what the hell is going on? This seems like a systematic attempt to end the United States. How does the U.S. conceivably benefit from a war over Taiwan right now? There are probably pretty good reasons to prepare for a war with China, which may be inevitable, but that's not one of them. Colonel Doug McGregor joins us. Doug, thanks so much for coming on. I, you know, I, I can't do anything but speculate as to motive here. This is the cra one of the craziest things I think I've ever seen in my life. But is the United States military in a position now to stage a, a war with China? Well, of course not. You're 100% right on that topic. I think we have to admit that this is probably the most reckless and irresponsible administration in living memory. Uh, we don't have anyone that qualifies as a statesman. Statesmanship involves advancing American interests at the least cost to the American people. There, none of that is in play here. We're dealing with a group of posers, people who are posturing, Posturing is not statesmanship. And the American people need to understand something that no one has bothered to tell them. That during World War II, Taiwan was the unsinkable aircraft carrier of the Imperial Japanese Armed Forces. All the major invasions of China were launched from Taiwan. Beijing will not allow Taiwan to become a garrison state for American armed forces or Japanese armed forces or any foreign power. And if they think 
that we are going to ally ourselves with Taiwan, if they think we are going to intervene to defend that island in the event of a dispute, then we will be at war with China for the reasons that I just outlined. And we are not prepared for that. We are grossly overstretched. We don't have the logistical infrastructure. And frankly, there's an old adage that everyone should remember. A ship's a fool to fight a fort. You have to fight China from the sea. We can't win that. China can absorb everything we throw at it. And the Chinese are happy to sit there, let us travel thousands of miles to reach them, and then sink us. This, is, I, I, I don't know why every show on TV is not covering this right now. This seems like one of the craziest things that's happened in my lifetime. Do you have any speculation and guess as to why the Biden administration would want this? Well, the Biden administration and its predecessors, frankly, treated everything that the Russian government said for the last 15 years about Ukraine with complete contempt. They're repeating that process. We see how well that's worked out in Ukraine. The Russians yeah. were always serious. Th hundreds of thousands of lives have been lost in this war in Ukraine that we should have acted quickly to stop. Now we're provoking the Chinese over an, over an issue that is at least as strategically important to them. That's beyond belief. Colonel Doug McGregor, I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Sure.